I'll give you a last second to get to your seats. Hopefully everybody had a great lunch. We forgot to mention that lunch was right outside the room, so if you haven't had lunch yet, well, you missed it. Um, our next speaker, um, we, we actually managed to get two fantastic keynotes today. So our first keynote this morning, as you remember, hopefully not too, too long ago, Vint and, uh, and, and Satya. Um, our second keynote speaker actually is, uh, is Kathy Mar Marshall, who's an adjunct professor at Texas A&M University. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about her. Um, but the topic that she's going to be talking about is should we archive Facebook, why the users are wrong, and wh why the NSA is right. Um, and true to form, when you try to find anything about Kathy online, well, it's very difficult. There's not much. Um, so I think she'll, she'll probably give her own bio as she, as she goes through this. Um, but before being a, an adjunct professor at Texas, she was a principal researcher at Microsoft Silicon Valley Lab. Um, she is a pioneer of hypertext with more than 20 years experience in that space. And prior to that worked at PARC, which is the Palo Alto Research Center, um, where they create, where they've actually created things such as things that we use today, laser printers, ethernet, graphical user interface, and there's the list goes on. Um, and her passion, from what I understand, is human interaction when mediated by technology. So, Kathy, I think uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. I fooled him, didn't I? <laughs> Since I'm talking right after lunch, I thought I would start with sort of a clickbait thing. Three things studies show us that Facebook users believe. That's kind of clickbait, isn't it? You might not click on that, but you know, got to do what you can with what the research you got. And the next thing I'll talk about is usually I'm, I'm a big advocate for users. You know, I, I think the users are right. In this case, I came to believe the users are wrong. And I'll tell you why I think so. And after I tell you that, you may say, no, the users are right, Kathy, you are wrong. And I've had people tell me that after a talk. So you can feel free to come up and tell me that I'm wrong because you'll, it'll, be obviously, it'll be obvious why, whether you believe me or not. And what I'm going to talk about is the personal stories and big data project that I've been doing, how this leads us to think that we might want to archive Facebook. And that's the thing that is controversial here. The NSA thinks so. So we'll see. So here's the clickbait part, the three studies, people, three studies that show us what Facebook users believe. The first thing is that Facebook data is fine just where it is. And um, it's sort of a, a subset of what I think of as benign neglect. I've been looking at personal information management for many years and personal digital archiving for the last decade. And it turns out that for pe all of people's good intentions, they mostly just, you know, it's benign neglect. It's, um, it's they, they pretty much want it to be where it is. And this is a segment of an interview I did a couple of years ago. And I was asking the person, um, is Facebook your primary thing? And she said, unfortunately, yeah, I'm on it more than I want to be. And she laughed and she said, so my friends are in LA and Vienna and the East Coast, so it's a nice, easy way to keep track. And then I asked her in kind of a leading way because, I, you know, I was really hoping that she was going to want to save the stuff. I said, do you ever want to save any of this stuff? And I was thinking she'd want to save some of the pictures. She had a lot of pictures, and I thought, surely she wants to save those. And she said, it's all saved on here. And I thought, okay, so people kind of trust the copies that are out there. And this is a different interview, and again, I'm, I'm baiting a user. Do you ever save anything from Facebook? And she baits me right back. She said, you mean photos, or do I ever take screenshots of conversations? Sounds like she saves stuff, right? And I said, any of those things? And she said, no, I've never found a need to because I can always scroll back in the history, and the photos are in albums. So that gives you this sense that uh, the things are curated and taken care of. They're in albums. Um, so no. And then I said, do you back it up? And the interesting thing is whenever you ask people if they back up their stuff, they know they should. And so they always say, yeah, yeah, I do. And then if you dig, they never, ever do. The last time they created a backup was five years ago 
when they had a DVD that was lying around. And so do you back it up? No, no, yes, yes, we have a Lamborghini hard drive at home. She realizes that she should be, and she should be putting it on that hard drive. And then I asked her, well, how do you do that? And that's where we find out that's an excellent question. I don't back up Facebook. So people think Facebook's fine where it is. And there's a really good reason for this. Usually is one of the things is that there's, there's sort of a disaggregation of the necessary skills it takes to, to do something like use the, um, you know, Facebook has this download my data command. Usually these things are usable, but they're usable by different people than really want to do it. So the family archivist usually isn't the family IT person and might not even be the family photographer. They all might be different people and the family might have several IT people who come to, come to blows and, and you know, it's often chaos. I'm telling you, it's a, it's a, it's a war zone out there. I know this when I go home at Christmas and my mother says, you have to help me fix something in my computer. There goes the whole vacation. Um, the other thing is that Facebook data, one thing we found in studies is that Facebook data is people only think it's valuable in the context it's in. They don't want it rolled up with other data and put in an archive. They want it in place where it is, where it's meaningful. There's also, as I, as I um, show by my dust bunny, that's my uh, canonical dust bunny. It's as big as it looks. It's behind the bed. Uh, there's sort of a long-term tendency toward benign neglect. Even if people go take classes and they have good intentions to, you know, take care of their digital stuff, usually, you know, you check in with them a couple years later. Mm, they, they worked on it for a while and then they stopped. Creation is definitely more rewarding than stewardship. And finally, people curate their stuff on social media to reflect their current identity. So in the name of keeping it current, they destroy stuff. So you never get a full archive of their stuff. And that's something I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. And uh, it, this was one of the interesting things that I found. I periodically check in with the, um, the facility for uh, download my data on Facebook just to see what's up and what's up with the privacy policy and stuff like that. And so I went in there and um, they've become much more explicit about what you get when you download stuff. And I just picked out a few things. There were 70 categories of stuff you'd get if you did a download my data. And it really, it's sort of amazing, and I don't know what you would do with a unique number used for facial recognition, but you get it. And you get, you know, a list of your friends, a list of the friends you've deleted, all kinds of stuff. The ads you've clicked, you can get the ads you've clicked, all kinds of stuff. And most people, you know, that's, that's a lot. So, you know, to test some of these things out, we did, we did some studies uh, that used hypothetical premises, premises, and uh, one of them was, um, I know there's no one, I checked the, the list, and there's no one from Facebook in the room, I always make them cover their ears if they're in the room, but Facebook is faltering in this premise, and um, they, need, they need to make money a different way, and uh, our hypothetical user, Greg, he's been using Facebook for many years, and he's accumulated an awful lot of data. So one of the premises is, can Facebook sell Greg's data to Amazon? And even though Facebook currently sells data, most people don't feel very good about that. That tested out very negatively. People didn't like the idea, but if you ask them if they ask permission, all of a sudden things are much better. Turns out that asking permission even uh, just makes people feel much better about the whole thing. Although people will tell you who worked on game archiving, uh, Jerry McDonough, in fact, uh, first was talking about this. He said that a, asking permission is no panacea because then people don't grant you permission, they get hostile. So that, that isn't actually, uh, doesn't always work the way it's supposed to. How about can Greg sell his own data to Amazon? Much better. Turns out that if we're gonna monetize data, the user gets a piece of the pie, the user's happy. Much better. 
What about this last one? Can Facebook analyze Greg's data and use the results to sell advertising? We know that happens now. People are appalled. They apparently don't know this. So that's, that's uh, the first thing. Facebook data is safe where it is. Um, Facebook provides a, you know, a, a good sense of, of data safety, and I think there's little chance that people will create individual archives of it. And there's a strong sense of personal ownership of that data. The other thing is that Facebook value is immediate. And this actually kind of surprised me. I kind of thought that people would want to hang on to their Facebook data, you know, even if it was in place and everything else. I thought, well, it's not, you know, even if it's communication oriented, people would like that stuff that they've, they've posted there. And we tried some of these things, and it turned out that only half the people wanted anything, and of those, those half people, we, we just said, well, if you move to another social network, what would you take with you? And people said, well, photos, maybe friends. That's only a third. And 20% of the people said nothing, nothing at all. I'd like to start fresh. So, so it's sort of, it doesn't seem that valuable. And then in ethnographic studies, we found the same thing. And this just really surprised me because, you know, you can poke at people a lot and see if they'll, they'll you know, they'll react. And um, almost everybody in this study that we did Nobody wanted their Facebook data. I felt it felt so unloved. Kim said, well, I just can't think of anything in Facebook that I want to archive. And then Mary said, if my Facebook died, all those photos live somewhere else, and I don't particularly care about the comments that much. Ted said, my dog probably uses Facebook more than me. These are pseudonyms, obviously. I don't really care what people are doing on Facebook. I go there out of social obligation. I think the dog probably actually had friends there, but... I looked at the dog's page. It seemed like the dog had a lot of fans. And Lynn said, if Facebook went down in flames, no, there is nothing on there that I'd want to save. And we were hard pressed to find anyone. We interviewed, a, a, you know, this was a, an in-depth study to complement the other study we did. And very few people want to save what's on Facebook. And this, this sort of surprised me. And what turns out to be true is no matter how neglected people's websites are, um, and, and how it, it turns out like they, their Flickr accounts that they pay for might be where the archival stuff is. Facebook is just like, well, this guy forgot about it. There's a dotted line because he forgot about it. He was drawing a map of all his online stuff and Facebook turned out to be so trivial that he forgot to put it on there. I had to tell him, you know, didn't you talk about Facebook? And it turns out that the only thing that seems to have value, and this was, LinkedIn, but I think it applies to Facebook too, is the social network itself. People don't want to, they have friends, they're legacy friends. They don't want to refriend and try to remember who they friended. They don't want to refriend their ex-boyfriend, but they want to look at the pictures that he's posting there of his new girlfriend. They don't want to, you know, people have their reasons for not wanting to reconstruct those social networks. And uh, so it turns out that Maybe the social network itself has value, but people don't think of that as an artifact of Facebook. So, as I said, the, the, I'm just summing this, these, this uh, second thing up, is that the data serves communicative purposes rather than archival purposes, and other online services may be where things are archival, and people might see value in the social network itself, but not in the data they've hung off of it. The third thing, and this is the thing that where I'm saying maybe the users are wrong, I'm saying they're wrong too about the value of the, the social media data, but uh, a, a Facebook archive is not a welcome idea. It's not a surprising idea either. I, I know that the Library of Congress did this this great video with uh, Library of Congress did this great video about five years ago with I, I think they were um, middle school children, and the middle school children said helpful things like they should save Facebook. That is our generation's scrapbook, yearbook, Guinness World Record. Although I do understand that now kids that age are all off of Facebook and on the Snapchat. So, but they use it to communicate with old people like me. So. It's still around, 
But uh, we, did, we did a fairly large survey, and three quarters of the people just objected to the idea of a Facebook archive. They said, no way. Uh, they think it violates, obviously, principles of privacy and data ownership and the control of their identity. They don't like the idea, and I think that's why people objected to the Twitter archive, too. They don't like the idea that they can delete something and to maintain their own, their own uh, online identity, and it can be in the archive, still representing them, misrepresenting them, representing them as they don't want to be represented. And this, this actually surprised me, is that in projected future uses, people foresaw all kinds of ugly identity theft and stuff like that as you know, the main use of such an archive. And after you see what I've done, you may agree. Um, content veracity and timeliness, which is, goes with the first thing, um, they can't be guaranteed. So people say, well, it won't represent me ac accurately because you know, it's, it's a snapshot in time and that's not right. And finally, there's no societal benefit to saving Facebook. They said, who cares about what people had for lunch? I do. 22% um, didn't object in all fairness, but the reasons they didn't object kind of bothered me. They didn't object because one of the things you hear is that all the data on the internet is in the public domain, and that's a common, a surprisingly common and wholly distressing misconception that people think that everything that's out there is out there for them to use, and uh, so they can't fight against that if it's out there in public. You should expect it, anything to happen to it. And the other thing is that Facebook content is trivial and harmless, as you would think, and that then there are some people that think that they're powerless to stop it and that the EULA itself permits something like that to happen. But the thing that I thought was interesting, that fewer than 1% of the respondents said there was some social good to doing this. Just two people out of almost 250 said, yeah, that's a good idea. So it's not a welcome idea. And now I'm going to kind of shift gears. I did some um, historical research that I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to try to show that it has implications for archiving Facebook. And it's a little bit of a scratch, but I think you'll see the connection here. So it, it also shows you how big data can have these intensely personal stories hidden in it if you put enough of it together. Uh, the story that I'm going to tell, I, I don't know, most people know William Burroughs? There aren't a lot of, it depends. Like if you do that in a room full of computer scientists, you say, does anyone here kn know who William S. Burroughs is? And everybody, no, they don't. But I think probably people in this room do know who William S. Burroughs is. He is a 20th century writer. Um, people credit him with being responsible for and one of the prime movers of the beat movement and the punk movement. And one of the things he's famous for is in 1951, he killed his common law wife. Her name was Joan Vollmer, and uh, that's who I'm going to talk about. And if you look in histories and biographies about the Beats, you get this really well-worn narrative about Joan Vollmer. She grew up in a swanky suburb of Albany, and she went to Barnard when she was 16 years old, where she married a law student at Columbia, and he joined the Army in World War II and, and was an infantry soldier, and she had his child named Julie. And then she met William S. Burroughs in 1945, and she was smitten. Stories should be familiar if you've ever read a biography of Burroughs. And she left New York City with Burroughs and had a second child, Bill Jr., in 1947. And they moved to Mexico City, where he shot her in the head. Neat ending, quick story. Turns out literary biographers knew very little about Joan Vollmer Burroughs, and they all used the same few sources. And it became kind of an echo chamber, and it kind of it kind of grew in funny ways in that it grew by rumor and innuendo. Very few people checked anything. And so there's this very pat story, and it turns out not to be very true. And I wondered if I could do a better biography of her and find out what really happened. And you know, it, it's a, 
the beat movement is essentially misogynistic. You know, it's not hard to see that. So, you know, I was wondering if, if we could see something about the nature of her influence on William S. Burroughs and, and do a better job of the story. So, um, I started before this, this uh, was published. This is Barry Miles did a biography that was published on the um, kind of uh, took advantage of Burroughs' centenary, which was last year. And he said, Joan hated both husbands. This is the first we've heard of a second husband. She married them and hated them for the simple reason that they were ordinary, stupid people way below her level. Let's see about that. It's the first mention of both husbands. Well, earlier, I had looked for a long time for a Joan Adams in the 1940 census because a grad student told me, well, she dropped out of Barnard and she married Paul Adams in 1940 and no one knows this. And so I went looking in the 1940 census for a Joan Adams and I couldn't find one. And then at some point this popped out of a search of a database of New York City newspapers. This is the Albany newspaper and it is a wedding announcement to a man named Henry Allen Keeler and they are living in Great Neck and they got married in Henderson and one very strange thing about this item is it was in January 20th, 1940. It was published then and they were married on January 9th. Wedding announcements usually aren't more than a week after the wedding. I decided it must be an elopement. So I started to look into it. And it turns out the city they got married in is right over the border in North Carolina. And I thought at first it was a vacation paradise, but no, it isn't. It's a tobacco farming town. And I wrote away to them uh, for the marriage certificate and got this and found out that the witnesses were the local hotel manager, a young doctor, and the minister's wife. And the minister was of a was the Church of the Holy Innocents, and um, I wondered what the deal was there. And it turned out it wasn't an accident. They were both Episcopalian. It was an Episcopalian church. You could see it from the train station. So there you go. That's Henry Allen Keeler. I've, after I looked for a while, I found a picture of him, found out he was an undergrad at Columbia. A lot of mixers between Columbia and Barnard. They were in the same class. They probably met there, and sure enough, there is, there, there she is, Joan Keeler on the census for uh, Great Neck Long Island. And the thing that you see is it looks like they went back to school there. They're both listed as being in college. It's not true. Uh, apparently had a chilling effect on her education. She checked out of the dorm without saying where she was going and got thrown out of Barnard and uh, never came back. And her family was horrified and I did find her brother and it turned out that this was true and he remembered her and said well he was a big bragger he really thought he was something and uh, played chess with her with her father and uh, he thought he was really something I remember going down to New York City with my parents Keeler got tickets to the football game he may have thought he was marrying someone with money he may have thought he was marrying into a rich family and it turns out that Joan Vollmer came from a family of very well-educated women, and her mother had finished college, which was not that usual at the time. And it turns out, more importantly, that her aunt had a JD from NYU, class of 1915. And by 1940, she was a powerful attorney. So what do you think happened to that first marriage? It was true, incidentally, that uh, Keeler did think he was marrying into money. Um, his father had gotten cited for fraud just a few years earlier. Uh oh, I'm running out of time here. I'll try to snap it up. 19, 1941 docket in the Kings County Court in Brooklyn. Indeed, her aunt represented her and had the marriage annulled. The, the plaintiff was underage. She was 16 at the time. So 20 years later, we see she made the right decision having her aunt get her out of it. That's who he married, his, his second and final wife. Um, she has kind of a Mrs. Nixon quality about her. But uh, 
Was it important to know all this? Well, I think it, it gives a strong foreshadowing of her impulsivity and kind of her behavior later on. And most importantly, it shows that you can construct personal stories out of big data. I went and I looked at um, what I had, and I had 343 little bits of uh, records and data. Um, I cataloged them about Keeler, and then altogether I have like 2,200 articles and little bits, you know, records pulled from here and there that kind of sum up her life. And I'm not done yet, but um, it just sort of shows you the power of all of these, bringing together all of these data sources. And I, you know, I kind of gone through and looked at the things I needed to reconstruct that first marriage. And you can see there's lots of different things and I'm going to not go through them here s in so much detail, but I'm going to say that some of these things no longer exist today. So just archiving those things isn't going to do it. It sort of seems that this kind of social information has moved to Facebook. But as we know, Facebook is fluid, unlike a small town newspaper, and it changes, and elements in it change at different rates. So it's easy to ch see some concerns and that those status changes, like that marriage, would be completely lost. She would have said, it's complicated. Then she would have said she was married. And then she would have said, it's complicated again. And then it would have gone away. And um, negative information doesn't kind of make it into Facebook in, in a certain kind of way, and that people have control over things like that. And there are changing notions of privacy. If you've ever looked at a city directory from the 1940s, you know that it's uh, got a lot of kinds of information that we think of today as intensely private. And so I think there are a lot of things still necessary to investigate to maintain a Facebook archive. Um, Things like a data, a data donation mechanism, because I don't think people are going to be very happy with, um, with just collecting some of this stuff, and an embargo policy, because a lot of the things I used were embargoed. Some of them are still embargoed. I wanted to get the court record from that divorce proceeding. I couldn't get it. The, the court in Brooklyn said, that's 100 years. I thought, well, good luck. I, making it to 2041, Kathy. So. So anyway, I think the NSA has the right idea. We, uh, you might disagree. Um, I just wanted to see how many of you think it would be a good idea to archive Facebook? Yeah, OK. Well, how many people, I, I'm curious, how many people think it's a bad idea? Okay, oh, will you do it? OK, good, good, good. That's, that's a good data point. That's, that's a good data point. Um, most people are furious about the privacy implications, and I know that after I've talked about this, uh, this Joan Bulmer research, people have uh, and said that used it as an argument for archiving Facebook. People have uh, people have read me the Riot Act. Even good friends of mine have read me the Riot Act. So um, good luck with that. Anyway, uh, I'd like to thank some of the people that have helped me. In particular, a um, a British historian, Simon Johnson, has been very helpful in, in picking up records. And some of the studies have been done with uh, my colleagues at Microsoft and Frank Shipman, my long-term collaborator at Texas A&M. So with that, I'll turn it to questions. Well, we've had naked lunch, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, uh, any questions? There must be plenty of food for thought there, I would have thought. Uh, we've got a question over here. Is there a open the mic? Uh, just say if you say where who you are and where you're from. Jack Cushman at the Harvard Library Innovation Lab. Uh -oh. I've been doing some work on very long-term, strong, dark archives, and so I'm wondering if people's intuitions about this change, if you told them that you wanted to save it, but that it couldn't be accessed for 30 years or 50 years or some amount of time to change how it could be used against them. We actually tested that. Um, I didn't, you know, you can see I kind of ran on too long anyway, but um, we did test the idea of what would make people happy, limiting access to researchers or embargoing it for 50 years. 
or only taking um, kind of the, the social network part. And it turns out that does mollify people to some extent, but not completely because they worry about people breaking into the archives. And they apparently don't know about things like the census and how well that's em been embargoed. So I, I don't know. But I, I agree there's a great need for, for dark archives of this stuff. I mean, I think it's really important to keep it safe. Keep it and keep it safe. Uh, anyone else? Uh, just at the front here, down there. Hi, I'm Daniel from the Portuguese Web Archive. I was wondering uh, if you also ask the same people what do they think about archiving paper newsletter, uh, paper letters, or other kind of media, or personal media that they have. Because what I was thinking is maybe these kind of people, they don't care about keeping anything for the future. Because th that is something that is really um, normal. When, when you we only see the value of things many years after. Because right now, I get my paper um, uh, mail, which is not a lot, and I throw <laughs> it in the garbage. <laughs> But maybe in a few years from now, I'll see value in that. So I was just asking if in your, in your uh, study, did you ask them if they value archiving other kind of personal media? Oh, yeah. And what did they, they, they do. Yeah. They do. Actually, that's the interesting thing is that they do value other things. It, Facebook is seen as particularly trivial and, you know, in the moment. So they do, I don't know, paper letters, I thought I was the only person who wrote paper letters anymore. I thought, but you know, I don't ask about paper letters. I don't want people to laugh at me. <laughs> you know, um, but I'm sensitive about my age, but uh, I, I think they do. And some people pay for um, things like Flickr still because they, have, they think of them as archival. They don't think of Facebook. Facebook is peculiarly non-archival. That was one of the things that I wanted to point out. That surprised me, too. I was just shocked. And I thought it was the thing that you mentioned, but I think they are somewhat aware of, of the differences and, and the things that they have. So, so they, they, would, they would value web archiving, archiving the public web? Uh, it depends on, that, that actually depends on who you ask and how you ask it, I think. But um, of their own stuff, they, they see some, you know, some virtue in some of their stuff, but, but not that. I, I think they're right in that they don't see the, like, if you get, talk about newspapers, they, you know, they glaze over, they say, newspapers? Who reads, you know, do you still get a newspaper, they ask me? So, yeah, it, you're right. It does. It's, it's, a very, it's a question that's very sensitive to where you see value in your stuff. Thank you. Uh, maybe just a quick one, uh, just Tobias here. Um, uh, Tobias Steinke, German National Library. Um, do you think um, the different functionalities or different aspects of Facebook might uh, influence the, the view of archiving? Because on one hand, Facebook uh, is uh, sometimes what uh, in former times the home pages were, where politicians, where companies, where uh, uh, institutions have their main page with information about uh, their company, the, the political yeah. uh, things. And on the other hand, Facebook deals as a communication media uh, to uh, chat and to do private conversations and maybe it depends on, uh, that's why we heard yes and no, sometimes you've, uh, uh, the question, do uh, should we archive it? Because some think of this as the home pages to archive and some think of this as private conversation and th then you get different answers. Right, and I was, I was mostly asking people to reflect on their own Facebook stuff, not on the Facebook stuff they might use and they might have a different feeling about the Facebook stuff that they, that they rely on and that, that often turns out to be true. But uh, we're, I was particularly interested in personal material up there, so yeah. But I if you ask the librarians here, or from uh, archives and so on, uh, you might get a yes because they think of this kind of stuff, the open available stuff on Facebook, uh, uh, and that needs to be archived. Right. And if you 
think of the private stuff, maybe you get a different answer from the same people. Right, and, and certainly, um, you know, if you ask the NSA, the private stuff is the best stuff. So, yeah. Um. Well, that was great. I think uh, uh, it's great to hear that you, uh, you like writing letters. <laughs> I, I, I do write, le you know, if you don't watch out, I'll write, uh, you know, it's a threat. I write long well, letters. We'll, we'll, help you, we'll help you write those letters as long as you, so you, you, you get some nice gold ink as well. So uh, to oh, write those okay. As long as you promise to write about when it gets complicated for you so that when we do research on you, we'll be able to find those. Oh, those no, you'll stuff. never find my <laughs> stuff. Uh-uh. <laughs> Thank you very, Thank you. very much. Appreciate Thank you. I think that's uh, one of those one of those talks that as you walk away later to this afternoon, it's like when you watch a comedian, you kind of drive home and you go, "Oh, now I get that joke." This is going to be one of those talks where you go, "Oh, that's what she meant." This is a it's it's one of these things where uh, I think it's going to lead to a lot of uh, discussion later on this evening. And as if that wasn't deep enough into our uh, our personal lives, uh, Megan Doherty from uh, Loyola University of Chicago, the assistant professor of digital communication is going to speak to us about generating granular evidence about a lived experience with the web, and so archiving everyday digital life. So I guess uh, more on the same theme. So Megan, over to you. Absolutely. Is it on? Yep. Can people hear me? OK. I'm used to teaching, so when I'm in a room this big, I just yell. So if I start yelling into the microphone and it's too much, just wave at me, and I'll settle down a little bit. So um, thank you for having, having me here. I'm really excited to, uh, to give this talk today. Um, my colleague Annette Markham and I are studying lived experience of media in a mobile, fragmented, and digital era. We're both communication scholars, so that's sort of, that's the quick background. Um, in this project, we're asking questions like, how do researchers recognize the artifacts of digital living? What do we look for? What do we elicit from our research participants? And then, what do we do with those artifacts? Not just how do we keep them, but how do we contextualize them? How do we interpret them to make meaningful meaning? And what influences that process? That's a really important question to me. What actually influences the process of me making meaning from the stuff that my participants leave behind? So today I'm going to talk about a project that we've been working on for about four years now. My hope is to generate a conversation about the nature of evidence when studying lived experience of the web. And we wonder how accounts of everyday digitally lived life may or may not be woven into web archives. So this is going to be a lot of examples that I'm going to show you today. And it's important that I say that, um, that I have permission from all of our research participants to show these examples. Um, so based on observations and experience, we think that everyday digitally lived life looks a bit like this. It's an active flow through an information space that's complex and chaotic. So let me show you what I mean here, how we experience web artifacts in this complex way. So my colleague Annette in 2011 began capturing her web-based experience of the Japanese earthquake and its aftermath. Um, this was just her way to sort of see what was actually happening, right? How do people actually experience these kinds of events in online social spaces? So how do we experience web artifacts in this complex way? So she captured this material to show what she's called flow in digital media. So we'll begin here with her checking in on Facebook. And there's a video clip in her feed called Japan, forwarded by a friend, forwarded and commented on, and so on and so forth. And the video is called out, so I'm going to turn it down. Um, the video caught her curiosity. It was posted by a 13-year-old boy to his mother's wall, and it was forwarded to him from another friend who had posted it on his wall. The timing was important. It was posted during a time of heavy interest in all things Japanese immediately following the earthquake. And she wondered how information like this video was flowing through specific platforms and across various platforms. This digital artifact, this video, 
quickly becomes more layered when we see what surrounds it physically in this space on YouTube. This context is completely different than the Facebook context where Annette originally encountered it. So we could start anywhere in this flow of information, but as soon as you do, the object of study starts to slip away a little bit. The contexts are endless, and it's difficult to focus on which one is primary. Are we studying Annette's information flow? Are we studying digital video memes? Are we studying the social media presence of the Japanese earthquake? And so this digital artifact is important, maybe. But as a researcher, or more, more about what I do as an ethnographer, you're not really sure how it's important yet. You only know that it's there. So what do we do with all of these traces of digital material culture? What do they all really say out of context? How do we choose what it is that we study and what artifacts we actually follow? Um, this is another example. Instead of going chasing that video, we could start chasing um, other memes. And a meme came up immediately after the earthquake, pray for Japan. Um, and this was just a screen capture that she caught of, you know, she Googled it, did a little Google search and this was something that showed up. It's sort of fascinating, it's interesting to see all of these memes and how they spread around, how they move around. But again, it's really hard to pin down what it is that we're actually studying um, and why it's important and how it's important. So this illustrates just one small example of the difficulty of figuring out with any certainty where the field of study is and what the objects we collect really represent, much less where meaning is actually located. So my main point here is this. The idea of what digital ethnographic fieldwork might entail is expanding rapidly and becoming rather chaotic. But we're still unsure of how archival data fits into that space, or vice versa, how fieldwork can fit into archival spaces. We might also consider the structural elements of these spaces that are so often invisible to us as regular users. In this example, a participant's Spotify account was generating updates in her otherwise unused Facebook account. Her friend assigned intention on her behalf, neither one aware that the posts were automated. This kind of infrastructural, these kinds of infrastructural connections are often forced, right? Have you ever tried to use a new app and found that the only way that you could sign in was through Twitter or Facebook credentials um, and then been frustrated because you either don't want to do that or you don't have those credentials? Um, and these connections, once they're set up, they're invisible. They're easily, very easily forgotten. And most troubling, they're very difficult to break. The accounts in this example could only be disconnected by deleting one of the two connected profiles. That's troubling for the user and the archivist and the researcher. Social spaces online blend into one another, making it difficult for us to really know where we are metaphorically as we surf the web. The infrastructure behind these invisible traces is, well, invisible. And this has to matter when we consider studying web archival material. The meaning made from digital traces we leave behind as we live our everyday lives are made from so much more than what we can actually see. For the most part, the way we live these invisible changes can feel a lot like this. She knows more about you than you do. Who doesn't? Yeah. What's happening? The staircase has changed, remember? Let's go this way. Before the staircase moves again. So my favorite part of that is uh, the fact that, you know, the staircase has moved and Ron is like, let's just get out of here. I don't care where we're going now. I don't know what we were trying to get to, but let's just get out of here before it changes again, right? Just move on. Um, so this is, we, we live these kinds of invisible changes very much like this. And Annette and I realized that what we could see, the traces that we leave behind, were telling only a very small fraction of the story of everyday lived life with new media. 
So we began experimenting with how to collect some evidence of these other traces of digitally lived life. Blending grounded theory and action research methods, we've conducted a series of data generation experiments. Our strategies evolved in response to what we saw we could collect about everyday web use and what we came to realize collected data would not reveal so easily. With each phase of data collection, we found hints of additional layers of evidence just beyond the explanation of our traditionally archived objects. The examples I'll show hint at a much larger field for web archives or web artifacts. These web artifacts don't only exist behind the screen on servers that we can query. Rather, they exist between us and they exist between us and our screens and they exist between each other in a much larger digital media ecological system. We found in certain ways that we could get a sense of attention, attention paid to these artifacts. So this is Olivia reading through her RSS feeds. Notice where she places her relative attention and the role this digital artifact plays. Scroll forward to the right spot. Come here. Look at this one view. It's Bill Murray. <laughs> we need to get that. <laughs> so I, I call my mom tomorrow. Okay. But um, I originally told her that she could say two weeks. I told her that she was like, if your family, I think that your family can come when she's here. They don't want to come when she's here. What? My sister's like, that would be kind of crazy to have us all there at the same time. Oh, okay. Well, I told my mom she might have to go to a hotel. So their conversation goes on for quite a while. And normally, if you're trying to capture some sort of digital artifact, you might only be capturing what's on her screen. And it looks like this image is really important to her. Um, so there are some traces that we just can't follow automatically or capture yet, maybe. <laughs> maybe that's too creepy. Um, but these other interactions are not only add layers of meaning to the objects viewed on the screen, but appropriately measure the level of attention paid to these objects, which we might otherwise very easily ascribe the wrong meaning to. They also give us a much bigger picture of the role these kinds of capturable objects play in our everyday lives. We found that we could also get a sense of presence and absence with our devices. This is Carly using her laptop webcam to record a video walkthrough of her Facebook feed on her phone. There's a picture of my nephew and my sister and I'm going to like it, and I guess I do that a lot to like my siblings or my really close friends, I'll like their stuff all the time, not because I don't, like I judge other photos more harshly of whether I'll like them or not versus my family because I'll always like their photos. And then... Keep scrolling. See a picture of a pair of shoes that I really like. And sometimes I'll think about liking those things um, just because they'll show up in my um, archive of things I've looked at when I like them. So if I ever want to go back and look at those photos, I can. Um, and uh, the Coachella Music Festival and Arts Festival is going on right now, so I've been getting a lot of Instagram photos of that. This one's really cool. It's like a bird's eye view of the 
festival. So she shows us her interactions with another device. She explains in excruciating detail at times, um, but they're very rich details that go into all of the actions that we take with our digital tools. We can see her really considering why she does the things she does with web tools. What's more interesting though is that she forgets about the camera or rather treats the laptop webcam as a close friend. It's quite revealing of the intimate relationships that we have with our different digital devices. We also found that we were capturing a strange kind of oral history of digital devices. So in another video that Carly recorded, she explains the day-to-day -day circumstances and how these web artifacts fit into the rest of her everyday life. So I am in my locker room. I just got done uh, with a fairly busy day, so I haven't really checked Facebook that much today, except for on my phone. Um, and I am going to analyze myself. So, well, not analyze, but write down observations once I go through this. So I clicked on Chrome, because I use Chrome for everything. And I'm typing Facebook in, and I put FA, and I always know if I put FA Facebook, my link will pop up right away, and I'm already logged in, so it's super easy. So here, this raw narrative serves as a way to remember what it was like to interact with these objects in 2013 when she actually filmed this. And finally, we got a sense of digital or embodied digitality. This video illustrates the kind of blandness and passiveness of web artifact engagement, but it's mixed with a kind of intensity that suggests that it's anything but passive. Um, in additional videos, we also asked participants to reflect on what they saw in their videos. So we also have notes or reflections from participants, some of which we called brain dumps. These are highly unpolished reflections, but are revealing about how we feel about the role of digital technology in everyday life. We also have more polished, composed reflections, a kind of poetic deep dive into the small moments, as, as you can start reading here. Um, we also did mapping and a number of other kinds of techniques. You saw mapping in the last talk. Um, once we saw the richness that our participants were generating, we started to see the gaps in scholarship, and we started experimenting with these ways of zooming in to the tiniest of moments. There are deep wells of meaning, of real life lived in small moments of interaction that are missed when we capture only the objects that we see in a vacuum. This is when we realized we opened a can of seemingly never-ending worms. We do not want a one-to-one -one scale archive of digital media experience, but we do want to show that our web archived objects, though they seem rich and malleable and informative, may be misleading when it comes to considering them as material cultural representatives of everyday dig digitally lived life. When we see the web as just a tool, we see it as a container for massive amounts of content, and so a computational approach makes sense, and it can give us some pretty cool results, and results that are much needed. But this approach tends to shift responsibility for the generalization of findings to the researcher, when it really should be a, a shared and collaborative effort between re researchers and archivists, and I can talk more about that later if you have questions, um, but I see I only have a few minutes left, and a lot more to say. <laughs> um, I think that this approach also reinforces a flawed outreach plan, which concentrates on tool builders and researchers who are computationally inclined in their inquiry methods. This is certainly necessary, but it, it could accidentally define the shape of future archives. Rebecca Solnit discusses the tyranny of quant the quantifiable in her book, Men Explain Things to Me. She described the tyranny of the quantifiable as the ways in which that which can be measured almost always take precedent over that which cannot. Annette and I are striving for an enduring richness of evidence for a digital media ecology. These are some quotes from last year's talks at the IIPC, and I think they're quite revealing. There are great efforts by archivists to explain that they consider web objects in context but the language used when talking about their work reveals assumptions that shape practice. And this can give us some answers as to why we've ended up with the kinds of archive we've got. And it may also tell us more about why researchers aren't engaging as much as we'd like and why whole fields of study that seem so perfectly matched 
for web archives are not more fully engaged. It does not take into consideration the web as a highly structured information space within which and through which we flow in everyday use. This is far more than just linked content or space filled with content to save or code that is neutral with no meaning. And it certainly disregards the everyday experience of the medium. In 2012, The Onion, a parody news site in the US, ran a story, internet archeologists find ruins of Friendster civilization. So you may have seen this. Last month, internet archaeologist Dr. Maxwell Fry stumbled upon the perfectly preserved ruins of an online community called Friendster. Dr. Fry, good morning to you. Good morning. Dr. Fry, tell us about this amazing discovery of yours. Well, it was called Friendster, and at its peak, it was a vibrant social network with more than 50 million members. 50 million? Wow. That's right. But then, out of the blue, the civilization just ended. Oh. And the site was completely abandoned. Strange. One day, Friendster yeah. users were posting a seemingly endless stream of bulletins about awesome parties and cool shows, and then nothing. That is Total so silence. eerie. Mm. Today, the ruins of the site remain perfectly preserved as they were at the time of Friendster's demise, sometime around mid to late 2004 AD. Wow. Their lives just come to a complete stop, like a, like a fly trapped in amber. Mm. Exactly. And it's yes. really beautiful. You can see how much work went into now, it. Now, you just made this amazing mm. discovery just by looking through an old desktop's browser history? That's right. And as soon as I entered the site, I knew I was the first human being to lay eyes on those pages in oh. many, many years. There must wow. be so much to learn from the remnants of this site. There is. Evidence suggests Friendster users or friends who are simple people, spending most of their time gathering the names of bands to display on large ornamental favorite music lists. Ooh, I'm getting oh. chills just looking at it. They were important to them just as they are to us today, but they revered something called six feet under, as well as the shins. They also prize photos of themselves drinking. Wow. Everyone looks so happy. Such a yeah. mystery. So what happened to Friendster? Well, no singular explanation is universally accepted. Some of my colleagues believe that a computer virus may have wiped out a large portion of the Friendster users uh -huh. and then the rest fled their accounts out of fear. Oh, no. Others believe <laughs> that Friendster was only meant to exist temporarily, to fill mm. a void left by another mysterious civilization known as All, or perhaps Aul. Wow. Now, if the public is interested, they can go to visit the ruins of the website at www.friendster.com. All we ask is that they leave, the, they don't alter any content. Right. They leave the site just as they found of it. Of course. Well, thank you, Dr. Fry, for being our guest. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Coming up, a new study has linked heart disease to... Okay, so this is ridiculous, and of course this is meant as parody, um, but we may all have lived that a little bit more closely than others. Um, but in all seriousness, we worry that future studies of web history could begin to look a little bit more like this and not at all representative of the actual lived experience in the digital ecology. Uh, we're talking you know, 50, 100 years from now, far future researchers who are looking back and trying to understand what Facebook is. Um, so we proposed this talk to IIPC in order to start a conversation. We see how the rich accounts that we've collected, if woven into or alongside of web archives, could be invaluable to far future studies of everyday lived life with technology during transitions between media ecologies. We're at a point in our study in which we think we found something really important, but we're not really sure, and we're really stuck on what to do with it. Um, so I'm here to ask for your help and your suggestions. So thank you. any hope that we'll all get on the onion. <laughs> um, uh, we're, we're running a tiny bit behind. There's one, there's one really excellent question that we can ask. Oh, don't, no pressure, no pressure. Yeah, it's got to be a corker. <laughs> but don't be intimidated. Uh, uh, one question <laughs> still good. Come on. Nicholas. <laughs> um, is, it a good, is it good enough? Are you sure? This, is, <laughs> this had better blow our socks off. So I was just gonna—I was just gonna bite on the question that you yourself sort of tossed toss out towards the end of your talk about how web archivists and researchers, ethnographers, could work more together. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, 
my colleague and I, Annette and I go back and forth on this because mainly the sticking point is the privacy issue. Um, that personally identifying information is, is just so incredibly complex. Um, so archiving this kind of stuff that I've shown today is, um, creates a level of tedium for researchers, but it's the kind of tedium that ethnographers love. Um, it's, and it also is, it's, we happen to get permission from these participants. Um, it's highly unlikely that we would get that kind of permission from others. But we've played around with um, a concept and um, we're trying to put together a project um, that's basically StoryCorps for the web. Um, so I don't know if anybody knows what StoryCorps is. StoryCorps is, um, uh, and I don't know exactly where it started, but right now it's um, a, a show that's on National Public Radio um, and it's a, a, a preservation, sort of a, an oral history preservation project. Um, and in particular in Chicago, there's a booth that's set up at the Chicago History Museum. There's also one at Grand Central Station in New York City, I think, or it, it, perhaps it travels around. But essentially it's this booth that you go into and it's for radio, it's for oral history. And you take, you know, say your grandfather who was in the war and you take him in and you interview him. And they're very touching stories, they're very beautiful stories, they're very much about everyday lived life. Um, and they capture elements of personal lives and, and everyday lived life that we don't otherwise see in other venues. And, um, or that are incredibly difficult to put together. And so we're, we're thinking about, well, how could we create that for the web? That you, the way you sit down and interact with your computer is so much more interesting than the stuff that's actually on the computer. <laughs> and so if we had that together with the stuff that's actually on the computer, maybe we would be able to tell an incredibly rich story of this digital media ecology that otherwise we wouldn't be able to tell, say, 50 or 100 years from now. So we're, we're really trying to think toward those scholars, those far future scholars who are looking back to today as history and trying to understand, like, what is this Facebook thing? Where did that come from? And why did people, people got so upset about it? What was that about? Um, to be able to have some sort of trace left behind of that. And so I really don't know the answer, right? I mean, we're trying to figure out this other project that might save some of that stuff, but we're really, as the researchers who are in this, and you know, four years into this, we still don't know which things are important to keep, which things aren't which things are really telling, which things aren't. Um, and the, you know, that video of Olivia, that's, I think it's like an hour long. It's a long <laughs> video with this one, you know, one minute slice of it that's only remotely telling if you think about all of these other things that are associated with it. So, um, man, talk about big data. That's it. <laughs> Fantastic, please put your hands together. Thank you. The good news is I think the next virtual machine that is going to be spun up on Olive will actually be running Friendster. So we'll, uh, I think, we, we thought we had a coup this year with getting Vince Cerf here, but I think we'll get Dr. Fry next year for uh, one of our keynotes. Um, so to round out, we've got a bit of, uh, we've been doing a bit of theming here in terms of the talks. To round out the small data research theme, um, we have Susan Osman from uh, the Netherlands, University of uh, Groningen, uh, assistant professor there to talk to us about uh, everyday sp saving practices, which I guess we've seen a little bit of uh, a few minutes ago, um, and uh, the concept of digital heritage strategies. So, Susan, over to you. Thank you. Um, nice to be here. And uh, I think my um, presentation overlaps maybe a bit, and also I will hope also over uh, adds to it a bit. Um, this morning I was a bit intimidated. I'm a cultural historian. I'm interested in technologies of memory. And I'm not an expert in the field of web archiving, but I quickly learned this morning that, like uh, Vincent Cerf told us, if you whine a bit and make the problem clear, there's always someone coming up and uh, propose a, a solution to the problem. And uh, I already got excited when uh, Professor Satya, I called the, the short version, uh, talked about the idea of capturing and preserving executable content as a way of having content, content and context in the same way. But um, that will be my conclusion, and I will not jump to that. Um, so my presentation is about personal archiving um, from a long durée perspective. That's me. 
Um, in 2001, Kodak acquired a uh, website where you could uh, upload your pictures and uh, share it there and also store it there. And uh, it was, it was uh, later renamed Kodak Easy Share Gallery. And around 2008, it had about 16 million users and uh, billions of images. Um, it was a very interesting way where you could see that an old company like Kodak, who had, of course, a big name in terms of uh, uh, pictures, um, was able now to keep and protect and share your pictures online in making it a company for the 21st century. And they promised in the clip, and I won't show it to you today, that uh, it will live forever if you uh, buy this easy share camera, push the button, and then without any, um, without any skills, you could share it online. Um, it was a great fun to a lot of people, but then also you could see that a lot of people had a bit difficulty with understanding this whole new concept of saving your pictures uh, by a company like Kodak in this new age. Uh, there were some complaints by people um, when they found out that they should continue um, printing um, pictures, purchasing your prints, and if not, the gallery would, um, would uh, permit uh, the user to have access to the pictures. And uh, there are many complaints to be found on the internet uh, from about that time. Uh, saying that Kodak takes hostage of my pictures. Um, matters went even worse a bit later. In 2012, Kodak uh, faced foreclosure, and what happened was that um, uh, the company Shutterfly uh, took over this enormous amount of uh, pictures. Of course, the um, customer could still have access to his or her pictures if you would follow the email, but not everyone. If you were a citizen, from outside um, the US, like for instance in this case, Francesca Miles, um, she was from the UK and she could not access the picture. On Facebook, she complained that uh, she received an email, but that um, Shutterfly uh, confirmed that it was only for US customers. And what happened was, of course, that a lot of people lost their pictures, their wedding pictures, the first steps of their little children, so they lost their family history, and there are more stories to be found if you are um, interested. Um, I think that a lot of people put their trust in this company, Kodak, with its long-standing uh, tradition, and also uh, they built their trust in, in, um, in, in, in pictures, in family pictures, that they put their trust into the wrong hands, and uh, that it didn't work out. Around that same time that Kodak um, was having trouble keeping up uh, their company, there was this uh, initiative by a Dutch filmmaker, Johan Kramer, he, who, was a film, who is a filmmaker and a Super 8 fanatic, um, who saw that um, Super 8 uh, Kodak Home um, was slowly disappearing. And around 2010, uh, the last lab in the world that was still developing a Kodak Home uh, would shut down and Kramer bought the last 25 uh, Kodak Home 8 millimeter reels, and uh, what he did, he was uh, making 25 portraits of children. Because he loved the color of Kodak Home so much, he wanted to give those 25 children the same kind of childhood memories as he had, and I will show you a very short clip. you hear is, of course, the projector is turning on and we have a nice sound of the projector.
think I will have to stop the clip here. I don't want to get back to my Okay, here it is. Um, of course, what Kramer did was trying to recapture the whole aesthetic of Kodak Home, trying to recapture also the whole idea of what it is to, of using film, including showing the faults that it that is in the film. Um, there is, of course, a, a kind of strange, uh, almost anachronistic uh, aspect in this whole project. Um, we now look at this material online on Vimeo, and this was uh, uploaded by the filmmaker itself. And also, if you want to buy this um, thing, you could buy this box, uh, which kind of, um, this is not the, uh, an original box, but one for sale, uh, a Super 8 box, bye-bye. And in that box, there is not a real, not a Super 8 real, as you maybe would expect, but a booklet, and in this booklet, there is a DVD. So what's really happening here is that Johan Kramer uses different kind of formats, different kind of materialities of um, trying to recapture this whole idea of film. And uh, I thought that was an interesting um, aspect because, of course, um, uploading something on, uh, on the internet, on YouTube or on Vimeo, is so much different than using Super 8 projection uh, at home in an intimate circle. Now you share it with a potentially of millions of people. Uh, buying a thing like this, an, a, a reproduction on DVD, is of course so much different than this unique Super 8 film that most people have and that is stored in a box somehow and that is not for sale because it's uh, private material. But um, by doing this, um, he kind of triggered me thinking about this, this whole idea of, um, um, on the one hand, resistance to new media for storing your memories and on the other hand, trying to use them and appropriating for that. And also the idea of what you can see a lot now is a kind of technostalgia where people not only used it as a technology of memory, but make it into a me memory of technology, so to speak. And you can see that also that in uh, this picture underneath the uh, uh, memory stick, um, try to reinvent the idea of this little box just like this uh, Kodak box is. Uh, these are all different kinds of uh, strategies that re that reminds us, as uh, Roger Silverton explained, this double articulation that is always going on when people uh, use different kinds of media. Media carry messages, but at the same time, uh, they are also artifacts charged with symbolic meanings. And of course, Super 8 has this symbolic meaning of private domestic uh, memory sharing. Um, and this is what... Um, interest uh, me a lot and is part of the take the other button part of the uh, research project uh, I'm doing in the Netherlands um, with a group of people um, and it's called changing platforms of ritualized memory practices and uh, within this proje uh, project we try to understand how people over a long period of time um, tried to um, produce their memories and uh, save their memories on different formats, from film to video, VHS, to uh, digital uh, media. And what we are trying to do is um, rethink the technological, social, and cultural dimensions of traditional and ritualized forms of mediated memory practices. So it's not uh, unintended, but intended kinds of forms of uh, memory making, and how changing technologies of memory production, so film, video, and digital, have shaped new practices uh, of memory staging. And we try to historicize both the means, so the, the technology, the camera, the projector, um, and the meanings. Hey, what, what does it mean, and how do people think about saving practices? And especially, we look at specific moments of transition uh, and see what happens there. Do we, we try to find out some specific um, intergenerational negotiation within the families and see how they cope with emerging new technologies of memory and uh, try to ground it into a kind of social, historical and material context. And um, look at continuities and both also at uh, discontinuities. Um, as part of the project, um, of course, we also get to this day and age, the digital age, where people are now uh, working with new kinds of um, uh, new kinds of uh, media. Um, and I think it can be very interesting to um, 
to see how everyday use of digital technologies has changed, kind of established more routine-like ideas of uh, memory making and production and storage. And what once was a real, uh, then became a video camera and now is a kind of smartphone where people uh, make their pictures. Uh, what once was a real has become a tape or a DVD and now more dis dispersible content accessible via different routes, local or, 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 or offline or networked. And um, what does it mean in the sense of how people um, value their saving and their strategies? And we saw some interesting examples by Cathy Marshall um, that sometimes people don't even think about saving their pictures. Uh, that does a, a home movie or a home video in this digital age or a picture, um, did they change in the way we put weight into it? Uh, of course, it's very challenging um, to reconstruct historical practices. I mean, we do have the film, we do have a camera, or we do have a projector in the film archives, but it's very difficult to reconstruct how people were really uh, viewing or watching their home movies and what, it, what does it mean in a way they shape their memory there while watching. It is difficult to reconstruct how people were looking and watching uh, the video recorder and the television and, and um, what does it mean when suddenly silent film becomes uh, with synchronous sound and people had um, not to talk because the television would talk and the sounds were recorded. So what does it mean to the way people um, uh, look at these images? Um, we, we used all kinds of different sources, uh, books, manuals, etc. We even tried to um, make a theater play so that we would have a kind of experimental media archaeology where we could um, reenact different domestic situations. Um, but with this new digital age, we can now be on the spot and try to find out how users archive their personal audiovisual memories in the digital age. And I thought we had some uh, very interesting uh, example how you could do that with uh, live recording how people watch their Facebook pictures. We try to think of about a, a more biographical approach using the idea of user generations where you um, think about w uh, new technologies that uh, emerge and uh, maybe with new users or the same kind of users that use these new technologies and what it means to um, how this practice of saving uh, evolves, um, coming from film to video to digital. And then um, uh, we, we looked at three generations. I started with my students, um, who are not two, but 20. <laughs> um, they, are, they, they are at university. And um, they would do uh, first have some, um, try to describe their own practice. So what does it mean when they use their um, when they use their smartphone for making their, uh, their pictures and where would they store them, what would be their daily routine. Then they would interview their parents and uh, then they would also interview their grandparents to see how it evolves over time and then try to figure out types of visual record keeping um, and, and uh, analyze uh, especially the, the whole motivations behind this, these uh, practices. Uh, interestingly enough, maybe because it were history students, they said uh, they were not very um, skilled, most of them, and some would even have, uh, not even have a smartphone, but uh, some would say everything I produce will be saved automatically. I mean, these were master students and they didn't have too much awareness of what would be, uh, what would happening. Um, but later on they tried to uh, rethink what they were doing and then they would interview their uh, parents, and I think it, it confirms a lot of the results, what has been said before. Some father would say, um, uh, asked, uh, when was the last time that you put something on your external hard drive? Uh, he would say, I think it's been about four years ago. Um, the mother would say, um, uh, external hard drive, I think, do you mean the big computer? Um, so there is a lot of uh, things that um, they really weren't very much aware of. Also very interesting was a gender the gender division that uh, could be found. Uh, I haven't got the time to play these videos, but I think the slides will be available. Um, that, for instance, uh, one of the mothers, uh, uh, a mother of one student, she was in charge of doing photography. And uh, when it came to the digital age, the father took over and he had his private server. 
And um, so they, then the mother would stop making pictures or doing the agato thing and the father took over, but it didn't establish the new routines properly. So there is one Christmas where there's no photographs because the mother thought the father would not do it and the father thought this used to be the job of, uh, of, my, of my wife. So uh, one of the students who wrote a blog about this talked about a memory hole in his family uh, history. Um, I think these are very interesting things to analyze uh, further on um, in terms of storage location, uh, selection, uh, selection criteria, when, when do I keep or when do I delete my, my pictures, and uh, uh, in terms of curating. Uh, students were very articulate in, in how they, uh, when they would share their pictures to other students and when they would share it with their parents. Uh, so they had very strict categories and also in terms of sustainability. Some would say if it's really important I make a print, I go to the old medium. And uh, if not, if it's just ephemeral uh, at the moment, uh, I share it on Facebook and I don't care about what happens uh, afterwards. So they were very articulate, of course, at this point of their life. Maybe later on they would regret what they did. But they were taking chances. They were also counting costs and taking into account that maybe one day they would not, could, they could not go back to these uh, saving practices. It kind of confirms also what have been done to earlier research on digital photo ecosystems that um, within a family you can see generational differences, you can see negotiations that children are helping parents, that they uh, adopt different roles uh, in the way they uh, work with these um, family archives and that it's a continual process and I think that is very important, a shuffling and evaluation where um, Every time there's, of course, uh, something new that people have to adopt, appropriate, and, and try to figure out how um, they could use that for their family archive, which is an important uh, duty, as a lot of parents feel it in that way. So to get to a um, conclusion or maybe a, a request, talking about these technologies of memory, you can also call them technologies of the hearth, as John Tomlinson once described, they're kind of imperfect instruments in, this, in the sense of that um, they never fulfill everything you need. They, um, the, uh, these are instruments by which people try to maintain something of the security of their cultural location or of their family um, history. And, uh, but one of the findings I think so far is that except for the results is, um, and what maybe could be important here is um, that we really need a contextual approach, that it's not only interesting to keep the pictures or the videos we find uh, online, but um, that technology matters in the sense of that people really uh, put weight in the way uh, it has been uh, produced. And, um, but how do we keep those everyday saving uh, practices? So how do we not only keep the pictures, but the way people made the pictures or understood their pictures? Well, I just saw one example or of, of uh, how maybe we could do that. Um, and I was also excited this morning about this whole idea of um, the um, saving practices as executable content. So uh, that you um, try to save not the content, but the whole context. And um, that people work in this digital environment where they make and watch the pictures and that somehow um, we find the means um, to save all that, and um, that would be a very great step forward. Thank you. Pretty great. I think we've got time for a, a couple of questions. Uh, hands in the air, what you just don't hear. No, we're not going until someone's asked a question. <laughs> Thank you. Ah. <laughs> I hope you see that there. No, you've got to ruin your break. Were you able to follow up on the people that that uh, lost their Kodak memory albums and what they, you know, wh what they felt in retrospect? Um, I don't think I don't have it handy, but I oh, sorry. Um, were you able to? talk to the people that lost the Kodak memory albums and what they felt in retrospect? Um, not yet, but that is uh, certainly part of uh, a thing I, I like to do. I'm, I'm now looking for lost stories. So uh, uh, this is one of the projects that, um, 
for the for the next uh, year is uh, on the agenda. Yeah. Oh, okay, because I heard a lot of it's like a fire. You have just have to move on. It was really very fatalistic, but uh, it, it's it, it probably changes over time. Maybe people are less fatalistic now as yeah. they've lost more stuff. Um, th uh, th I think there's also a kind of continuity there. I, I mean, we, we also talked uh, a lot to people who lost their the pictures that were printed. So are people um, selling the pictures? So why can you buy family pictures at the flea market? Because a lot of people don't care. I mean, they. Um, they just do it away or maybe they die and, and, and the children don't think a lot about it. So this is not something that is only happening now because it's digital or because it's found ephemeral. At, at the same time, this whole idea of, of pictures now becoming part of this communication idea was, was also already um, embedded in, in practices of uh, memory making in the early days. When you look at a home movie from the 20s, people are waving to the camera, which means that um, when someone would take out his camera, usually a father in the, in the early uh, uh, first half of the 20th century, um, that would be a moment of, of having fun or making fun. So the part of the fun was not the keeping of these films because they usually ended up in the attic or in the cellar, but uh, the idea that this is a special moment so you take out your camera. So both aspects, the, 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 the community, communicative part and the saving part were always part of this. And I think um, what this historical perspective learns is that um, not that nothing is new, I mean, I wouldn't say that, <laughs> but we have to keep in mind that um, they were always part of the practices. Any, anyone else? Well, in that case, thank, thanks very much, Susan. Um, uh, just, just a reminder, um, uh, please go and uh, refresh yourselves. Uh, and if you could uh, be back at 3.45, uh, we've got a, got a last session of the show. <laughs>